Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. From pirates to aristocrats, the kind of people accepting Islam from the British Isles is as varied as each of our characters. But one important story remained buried for a hundred years and has now been brought to light, alhamdulillah. It's a story of a working class woman of immense bravery and intelligence who hailed from the same area as my father's family. Now, Liverpool in the north of England, where Elizabeth Kate was blessed with her awakening, was an area described at the time as the most drunken and violent in the United Kingdom. But this brave sister's test and determination give us questions about how Islam can look in the British context. How can we organize ourselves? What does dawah actually look like and mean in our context? And what mistakes and victories did our earliest organized community have? So my guest today has written a groundbreaking work called Our Fatima of Liverpool, and we're gonna be exploring that. Yahya Burt is a British American writer and academic. He holds an Oxford University MPhil in social and cultural anthropology. And his research interests include Muslims in Britain and Europe, Islamophobia, contemporary Islamic thought, and I want to add an interest in working class converts to Islam in Victorian Northern England. Bismillah rahman rahim Salaam alaikum, Brother Yahya. Alaikum, Salaam rahmatullah. Um, I think I want to kick off uh, with a taste on the flavour of urban Liverpool in the 1880s, because really the roots of our uh, Muslimness in the British Isles, if you like, in that first community come from this very dynamic, quite frightening uh, reality. T tell us about Liverpool in the 1880s. Well, you know, this was uh, Liverpool's heyday. Um, you know, a, a, a something like half of Britain's shipping went through Liverpool, and that was a seventh of the entire world. But it wasn't just the freight that was powering Industrial Revolution in the northwest of England at the time. It was also um, the major passenger port as well. So you had people coming from from the east, from the east and from the, the West African coast. And so Liverpool on the docks and the area around the docks was multicultural. So many people were coming in and out of the city. And obviously it, it would hugely, hugely expanded. You had a huge Irish population, a Welsh population. So it was very lively mix of different cultures come to this boom town basically that was the the you know the, the the main port for for the industrial heartland of the country um so there was great wealth being generated there there was also great poverty um and there was great you know great cultural interchange and dynamism so it was an exciting place to be um despite all the problems obviously that it was facing but it was known for drunkenness. Um, unfortunately, I've got too many uh, alcoholics in my family who were scousers as well. You know, we well, we got that in our family. Like, you know, we got that in our bishops, bishops in our family, and alcoholics. That's what we are. <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, you know, the, the, with with um, something like forty to fifty thousand sailors coming in and out of the docks every year, and they they got their pay when they landed at the dock. And with all this money in their pocket, they spent it on booze and and women. You know, there was a there was a lively trade in in uh, in prostitution as well on the docks. So you know, there was a lot of attempts to uh, by the police to try and crack down on brothels unsuccessfully for the most part. Um, and there was also the temperance movement as well, which was a kind of uh, which was really driven by devout Christian women started in America, um, but but spreads globally to Britain and other places, including Liverpool. Um, but it was allied with progressive causes like anti-imperialism, trade unionism, um, the rights of women, and so on. So it's a, it's a very underappreciated movement. It's sort of seen today mistakenly as a kind of puritanical movement. Actually, it was, a, it was a, aligned with progressive causes at the time. But one of the heart, at the heart of the temperance movement as well was that the liquor trade is a great evil. So there was a judgment there. And did that come off the back, this movement um, of, you know, there were lots of Catholics, Irish Catholics who lived in Liverpool, but there was also Protestantism. Weren't there kind of warring factions on the street around this time? Yeah, there was, um, you know, it was a, 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 a divided city to a certain degree. You didn't marry across the line. 
Uh, in fact, you know, my family comes from Liverpool and in earlier generations, you know, my grandparents broke that taboo and neither of the two sides really spoke to each other after that, you know, so it was a real thing even into the 20th century uh, and there could be sectarian violence and it was a cause of political split in the city. So the Tories played up the Irish question in, in Liverpool um, and were able to, um, you know, to, to, to secure the working class Protestant vote in the city uh, because of that. Um, despite that trade unionism flourishes, even under the, some aligned with, with the Tories, including, in fact, um, the founder of the first mosque in Britain, Abdullah Quilliam, he was a trade unionist and a Tory, both, uh, and was president for, of the Carters Union, among his many other uh, activities. So we can't tell the story of um, Fatima Cates uh, as she changed her name from Elizabeth to Fatima, without the, a little bit of the history of um, William Abdullah Quilliam, because they met, and he is this incredible, dynamic figure, both in Liverpool and, of course, at the heart of that Muslim community. Tell, tell us, uh, you know, some of the, the pivotal points that, that we need to know about Abdullah William Quilliam. Uh, well, apart, not sure. apart, sorry, apart from the fact his parents had a sense of humour, calling William Quilliam. Yes, exactly. Yeah, um, uh, I mean, Victorian humour doesn't always land, but but some of it does. Um, I mean, um, he was um, he, he came from a temperance background, uh, like many of the early converts in Liverpool, including Fatima, um, and he had a double training as a lawyer and a journalist, um, and through uh, overwork, his doctor told him to take a rest cure. He winds up going to Gibraltar to study the rocks. He had a passion for geology and decides on the spur of the moment to go and visit Morocco, where he meets Muslims for the first time. He comes back to England, self-studies and converts privately in 1886. Uh, but what makes him an historic figure is that the following year, he decides to actually call the people of England, the people of Liverpool to Islam mm. uh, through the temperance movement initially, because that was where he'd spent his youth actually as an activist and so i think he wanted to bring the temperance movement people uh, into islam by describing the the islam as the greatest teetotalist movement in history so this is one of the early things that really interests me about um abdullah quilliam is the way that he gives dawah so first and foremost but just because he um, learns about Islam in Morocco. He doesn't come back and dress like a Moroccan. He's very much the Victorian gent with the with the with the beard in that certain shape and the top hat for his work as a lawyer and the the frock coat. Um, mm. And yet, from his mouth was coming in English this great exhortation and love for the one he calls the great Arabian teetotaler. Um, tell us about his form of dower and who he would have been speaking to. Well, I think he he had a period of of reflection on this because I think after he privately converted, he tried a direct approach um, and um, attacking Christianity, looking at its shortcomings and, and comparing them disfavorably uh, compared to Islam. Um, but he found that that, that didn't work. He got a lot of, he got immediately kind of chastised and, and rejected and thought as a kind of bit of a loony, basically. Yeah. Um, so he, he then decides upon an indirect approach. And we see this preserved in what is probably the first dower lecture to be published in English anywhere, which is his address fanatics and fanaticism, which was recorded for, verbatim by a shorthand copywriter. Um, and so we have that and it was published. And, um, and you know, he, he basically sort of talks about how teetotalers are visionaries who, um, you know, are, are, are misunderstood um, and castigated and rejected. And he then talks about other sorts of pioneers and reformers like w William Wilberforce, the Hull MP who campaigned for the abolition of slavery in the British Empire. And then he talks about George Stevenson and the the invention of the of the locomotive steam engine and the first railway line between Manchester and Liverpool and how there was there were a lot of naysayers about that scheme as well. Uh, and then he goes on to talk about the Prophet Muhammad, 
peace fear upon him. If somebody who was similarly misunderstood, but was, was the greatest reformer of any arm and the prophet indirectly, um, through, through, through the route of talking about reform and teetotalism, obviously designed to appeal, as I said, in the early years, I think the first two years of his mission, his call, his dawa, was to bring the temperance movement, local temperance movement on board uh, but, with, his, you know, with Islam. I um, and, you know, the thing is that I should emphasize that as a young man, he'd worked right across the north in the temperance movement and was mm. well regarded. So mm. it, it, he was building from his pre-existing network. Let's put it that way. This was not a cold call for him. Uh, he was working with people that he already knew. So what we can take from that about Dower then surely is that um, you, you, you work within the people who you already know you and trust you, which is very prophetic, isn't it? The prophet, peace be upon him, was known as the truthful. He didn't come from somewhere else with an alien, um, uh, you know, character. They knew him. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that there has to be, um, uh, it's a challenge for all of us. Um, if we look at Britain today with the population of 4 million Muslims um, and who are racialized in significant ways, um converting to islam today is kind of a modern variant of turning turk which is what they used to call converts to islam in britain you know in the 16th century so i think that they, there's always been an, an attempt to cast islam as a foreign religion um when it's so clearly now a religion of the land a religion of the country um and so the challenge is going to be i think is always when somebody converts is to actually stay in their communities and bear witness um rather than seek the comfort of that formerly and strong community and just inhabit that space uh, and no longer inhabit the space of of our original communities or at least to do a balancing act, act yeah. between the two i and i i don't personally i don't think i've succeeded myself very well uh, in that um, Why not? Uh, Why not? What would you change? I think that I think that I, if I look back, because I've been a Muslim for over thirty years, I think that um, the cultural distance was much bigger back then um, um, between British Muslims and um, British society at large, and now that gap has closed. Um, but I think I had this sense of inhabiting different worlds, uh, making cultural adjustments. My, I'm on my own journey rather than thinking in the way that Quilliam thought but then he was in a different context really they were on their own um I'm not saying they were an isolated community far from it but um they they, they quickly developed an international reputation and contacts and so on but nonetheless they were basically on their own they admitted themselves to Islam they didn't read shahada to anybody they were they, they were still in the middle of their community even after converting if you see what i mean they weren't they weren't sort of there wasn't somewhere to receive them um, oh i see what you mean there was nowhere them. to go right yeah, yeah. they had to create their own, their own institution right. they had to okay. make their own mosque and yep. you know and that the, they only took their shahada later yeah. maybe two years after having admitted themselves to islam so you see what i mean they were doing it on their own anyway so we're going to, uh, I want us to, we'll circle back, remind me to circle back about how their their version of British Islam looks and what they brought with them because they were in this bubble. But let's talk a little bit about who was Frances Cates and what was her background, because I think there has been um, a good amount written, for example, about some of the aristocrats who um, may have converted to Islam. But for some reason, um, our Fatima was was left by the wayside how did you rediscover her and how hard was that and who was she a lot of questions there so there let, let, me, let, let me let me let me talk about her first okay. um so fatima um francis elizabeth murray as she grew up a working class girl from birkenhead um her father was irish her mother was from edinburgh um she was the fifth of six children uh she was at the first cohort to be educated under the Education Act of 1870. So that meant that she got an education up to the age of between five and 12. And we don't know much more about her early child, except she loses, her father dies when she's young. Um, um, her, and although her mother later remarries, I think that they they struggled and the older boys had to support the family. 
um, because I don't think Agnes, her mother, worked. Uh, and um, but she was curious. She was obviously had some education. She got involved in the temperance movement, became secretary of the local association. Um, and that's where she meets Quilliam for the first time to give this. He gives a talk about the great Arabian teetotaler in the summer of 1887. Um, so the thing is, is that she um, she. What's remarkable about, about her is that she. Um, she, she didn't let her background, her lack of advantages, hold, hold her back. Whatever opportunities she could take, she took. Uh, and she shows remarkable determination, intelligence, and perseverance in everything that she, she does in her short life. Uh, she only lives for th to the age of 35. Um, and, um, you know, she's a truly remarkable, inspirational figure. She was written about briefly in Ron Jeeves's biography of Abdullah Quillian, which came out over a decade ago. There's about a page, page and a half on her. Um, but um, with the work of my co-author, Hamid Mahmoud, and, and myself, um, you know, we decided she deserved her own standalone story. We didn't want the story of this first community to be focused on the, the, the individual founder, because it was a working class community of around about 250 individuals in, in total by the end, over a period of 20 years uh, with international contacts. Um, so people coming in and out of the community from all different parts of the Muslim world. So we wanted to kind of flesh out the story of this whole community. Um, and Fatima was an obvious person because for me, she really is the co-founder of the mosque. And she's she is was really the second most important figure in this community after Quilliam. And so we wanted to give her her due. Mm. Um, so in terms of like finding materials, um, um, yeah, we had to go to India to find that material because um, before the community produced its own newspaper from 1893, in the earlier years, you have to go far and wide to find materials. And happily, you know, Fatima's own story, her own conversion account was published in a in a in a journal published in Allahabad in India. Uh, it's a fantastic piece which we have at the back of the book. Mm. And that that really is what really was the nucleus of, of what helped us to to tell her story. Um and other than that, of course, we're digging in things like, you know, archives and old old maps and A to Zs and business directories and census and birth and death certificates, marriage certificates, you know, thin material. And also reading between the lines of um, beyond her own frag her own few samples of writing that survive poetry and, and, and prose, we were sort of reading between the lines of um the narratives of others, um, because after 1893. We don't have anything in our own hand. So we had to work very hard to account for the last seven years of her life um, is that, and, to, is that... and to do what we could to, to kind of read between the lines and fill in the gaps of that story. Which you did, which you did really well, because it goes between different um, people's accounts, which is really important. Because So it grows from her story to the community. I want, um, this is from How I Became a Mohammedan, September 1891. It's in the appendix at the end by Fatima E. Capes, e. Cates. Liverpool Muslim Institute. She says, when I was a girl about 19 years of age, I used frequently to attend temperance meetings. And it was at one of these meetings I heard Mr. Quilliam, a well-known in Liverpool and great advocate of total abstinence, deliver a lecture on fanatics and fanaticism. Up to this time, I'd always heard about Muhammad described as an imposter and a bloodthirsty man who forced people to believe in his religion by threatening to put them to death. These um, libels and misdirects and, and, and lies are pretty much here today. Nothing's changed, has it? I think that's right. I think that um, Islam, the light of Islam, is, is covered over by a veil of lies, calumny, propaganda, disinformation, misinformation, fake news, you know, black propaganda, you, you name it. Um, you know, we live in an information world, and I think, you know, we still, there's still this veil, but also there's the opportunity. I mean, it's easier mm. than ever today than ever before to open your phone or your laptop and listen to a, a, a devout Muslim talk about Islam at a click of a button, if you choose to listen to them. You know, so it, the opportunity is there. 
but also the the veil of of, of mm. misdirection is has also spread to the same online spaces so you know our work is still cut out for us i think um, you know you know what's what's fascinating is it oh it took one speech for her to 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 then she then she goes that's not what i thought let me um allah put curiosity in her heart for muhammad peace be upon him let me go and find out for myself so to anybody watching or listening to this i would say you know you wouldn't find out about bicycles and their uses and their positive impact um from um a car salesman you wouldn't find you wouldn't go to a vegan restaurant to find out the best cuts of lamb you know come to the muslim community and search the sources for yourself they're wide and varied okay but to go to people who are immediately critical and disliking and go that's my main source you're all liars that's problematic you 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 know we really must go to primary sources and the primary source for, for news and truths about muhammad peace be upon him um is the muslim community so um francis cates became fatima cates after a couple of meetings i think there were only two converts at the time brother ali and brother abdullah is that right was she the third that's person? right yeah the first trio of founding converts yeah. who form a society in july together uh, which becomes the Liverpool Muslim Institute and the first functioning mosque community. So Fatima was there at the beginning in July of 1887. Tell us about the rejection that she faced at home. Well, her, her mother Agnes was very devout. And uh, and when she, she caught Fatima at home reading a translation of the Quran, you know, she basically um, tried to take it off her. Um, and Fatima ran into her room, locked it, and said, I'm not going to reject anything I haven't read and understood. So, you know, I'm going to I'm going to study this this book. Um, and um, as soon as they heard about her, they, they, you know, they heard about her decision, and obviously there was a little surprise and anger and consternation in her family. You know, they tried to stop her going to meeting with the other two converts, um, you know, they they intercepted correspondence from Quilliam because he was writing to her at this point with some fundamentals about the teachings of Islam, as well as her self-study. Um, but she was dauntless. You know, she she just escaped home and went went across the Mersey and, and went to the meetings in Liverpool. And um, nothing, nothing deterred her. She was she was dauntless, you know, um, like a quiet legend, if you know what I mean. You know, she not, nothing held her back. Um, so. Um, and and she not only had challenges from within her family, she also had um, uh, the early meetings of the community were regularly disrupted by um, by street toughs. You know, people who would waylay them going to and from the meetings. Um, Fatima was you know often accosted on the street and held down, and horse manure was spread in her face. But this young woman of twenty two. She never backed down. She still went every single week uh, for the meetings uh, at the rented premises that they had. So they, when they started out, they were renting an upstairs room in a, in one of the temperance halls in in Liverpool. Um, and the small band, and they said it was really hard work to get people to come at the beginning. Often they said nobody was there but ourselves after we'd called people. Um, but but then eventually, slowly over about two years, that band of three uh, becomes fourteen or fifteen. You know, so incredibly hard work under very difficult circumstances. Even sometimes the meetings themselves could be broken up, you know. And there, there was, uh, on one occasion, there was violence, you know, that was witnessed by Fatima and 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 her husband, Hubert, who who hadn't converted at that time. Um, he does convert later in 1890, but but he witnesses, um, along with her, that the violence um, directed at the Muslim community. So... A uh, small Muslim community as it was, so um, you know he, you know they. Um, she saw a lot, but she, as I said, she was she was a she was a pillar of that community. I wonder what lessons we can draw from the way that they anglicised the anglicised the sermons and practices. Um, so I've got a book um, that was given to me by um, Sheikh um, Abdul Hakim Murad um, in uh, Cambridge. And it is um, Muslim hymns. And it's taking on that idea that the sounds from each area of the world, where we, where we come from, are really inside us in a way that we can't 
uh, fundamentally describe. You know, the, the, the tonality of an Indian Muslim, their understanding of tonality is very different from the traditional hymns, you know, Jerusalem and things like that. In fact, I know that our Asian and Arab brothers and sisters, because of their wavering tonalities, they find our, our way of, of music very boring. But to us, you know, it raises, it raises our iman, it, it does something to us. So I know that Abdullah Quilliam kind of anglicized sermons and practices. Talk us through how that looked. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, as I said to you before, they, they were on their own in the first few years and they admitted themselves to Islam. And all three of the um, first three converts all came out of the temperance movement. Um, so um, they, they had a meeting on a Sunday evening, uh, which to all intents and purposes looked like a Protestant evensong service, uh, but with Islamic content. So they had um hymns they took popular hymns from the from of the day they only changed the lyrics if they contravened islamic teachings or monotheisms as they understood them from the quran um and um they, they had a kind of sermon that was quite often quite either vehemently anti-christian or um you know gave out some fundamentals about islam or the prophet's life and um, uh, and they would have um, you know readings of the Quran from the stage. Um, they would read prayers from the stage. So it would be a stage then with with chairs, you know. And, and this 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 setup, this arrangement, it was carried over when they, they moved to their own premises in eighteen eighty nine. Um, so this carried on. So would, they would have uh, what what changed was that they would call the adhan for the first time in England. From the from the uh, out onto the street, uh, first in Arabic, then in English, then they would have this, what they originally called Sunday divine services, okay, and um and then after that they would have the namaz. So the 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 Sunday divine service was open to anybody to come in off the street, and the namaz, which was at a fixed time at about eight or nine, something like nine o'clock, they they would be only for Muslims. On a um, Sunday, not on a Friday. On a, sun, on a Sunday, yeah. Right. On a Sunday. You know what? Something has just landed with me. Because they were on their own, they kind of made up what a service would look like. They they didn't did they know nothing about what a chutzpah should be, or nothing about you know how to what, what was the actual namaz like? How did how did they learn these things? It's a little bit unclear, but the the namaz starts out off. They did they did offer a namaz quite early on or solar um but it was at a fixed time so the time remained fixed or timetable throughout the whole year was it so five it, times a day it, well I, maybe individually i'm talking about collective services yeah. at the mosque which by the way was called the church of islam for the first you know first i would say five or six years uh, it later gets called the mosque or the pro the pro the pro mosque provisional mosque i don't know what pro mosque means but some of the indian muslims were calling it a pro mosque i don't know what exactly what that means but it's there was a sign outside on the street which said church of islam and the thing is you have to remember that at this point in the early 1890s they were balancing between two things two competing sets of expectations okay so going from a period of isolation in a being in a bubble as you as you put it actually you know they're gaining huge exposures so from about 18 1890 they the word of this community spreads throughout the muslim world it's a sensational story so people start to come to visit and come to try and help them and so on so they had orthodox muslims coming both lascars you know muslim sailors who were coming onto the docks so working people as well as you know kind of law you know rich indian law students who would come to help them okay educated um and in fact one of them comes rafidin ahmed and gets them to read the shahada with him when he first comes up to liverpool so as i said they admit themselves to islam but later on an indian muslim says look i want to sit you down i want you to read the shahada to me and so, there was some, so, there, there, sorry there was a bit of pushback wasn't there from some of the um indian muslim visiting who said they didn't say it's, I don't, I don't know if they said it's kufr, but it's like, this is nonsense. You're not 
you're not doing what yeah, you Yeah, they're, they're saying it's nonsensical and, you know, it, it doesn't make much sense. And even some of the Ottoman sailors said the same thing. I didn't put all the sources in, but basically I'm saying you've got orthodox minded Muslims saying, you know, th this is this is all a bit a bit strange and, and dodgy. We're glad you become Muslim. But, you know, and then you had then you had the passers by on the street here in the Adhan and then they're calling people in and they want them to get something that's they're for culturally familiar with. So the hymns are hymns that the people who come in off the street would have grown up listening to. So they're caught between sort of the hostile slash curious passerby on the street because the, the 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 first mosque was on a very busy road the west derby road going into the city lots of foot traffic carriage traffic and so you know that any anybody could be passing that little mosque uh, which was just in a little georgian georgian terraced house um and at the same time word is spread in the muslim world and they're getting visitors so they've got two competing sets of expectations here at this point so what what, what you find is the community that's on a journey is a transitional movement from protestant christianity to sunni islam if you see what i mean so by about 18 1906 you know 15 years later the the, the mosque itself issues a prayer manual that is um basically hanafi fiqh i mean for tahara for purity and for prayer even though quilliam's introduction says you know really does god really want us to say prayers in language we don't understand you know uh isn't it better to still to say uh, you offer our devotions in english so he was never really entirely sure about it but the the prayer manual was written by uh, a muazzin of the community ahmed brown um so you know it's it's and also the indians provided an imams to come up um uh, to guide the community so um malana barakatullah bopali was was there in the between 1893 and 18 but i always felt that there was always a kind of a, a a kind of complicated thing going on where they still wanted to keep the appeal to the people coming in because it was a dawa minded institution and they wanted people to their, their primary mission was to get people to convert to islam and they didn't want to make it seem too strange to them so you know you have to remember there are very few muslims in britain at this time under 10,000 and so you know it's not like today mm. you'd probably meet a Muslim every day in this country now wherever you live but you'll at least see one but it was different back then um so I think that um as we see Fatima's story there were a lot of misconceptions flying around about Islam uh, so you know I think that it's it's something we need to we need to be um, straight about these sort of dilemmas, but at the same time view them with the eye of charity, I think, because they didn't have much to go on, didn't have any resources or you know, knowledge, but they what they did with the little that they knew was remarkable, I think, even yeah. if it's not what, what we would do today, because yeah. we're in a totally different circumstance. Yeah. But I think we have to sort of say, well, you know, they, they did it with a lot of a lot of bravado and confidence, and, you know, they just... You know what I mean? They 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 gave it a shot. They gave it their best shot. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair to say. You know. You, and, you know um, what's interesting is that um, you you see that Abdullah Quilliam he talked about temperance as a way of reaching people in this really torrid kind of scene of drunken sailors and Protestants and Catholics firebombing each other in the street and poverty and uh, you know industrialization and things changing. He said temperance and calm. And here's the man who practiced calm. So let's move towards calm. Now, Fatima, um, may Allah be pleased with her and bless her. She uh, really went out and talked about the difference between Islamic marriage and, um, you know, Protestant or specifically Catholic marriage, this idea of being tied to life. And, and she did that from a place of pain and as well, and determination. Talk to us about how she was trying to educate people about marriage whilst going through something herself. Well, you know, Fatima, uh, I mean, this is a, a remarkable thing. You know, she, as I said, she, the period we're talking about here, 1889, 1890, this is when she was at her most active in the Muslim community in Liverpool. She was the pillar calling other women to Islam. So we profile some of the women in the book. There were women that she met and invited to Islam who came to Islam at, at her hand. Uh, she was a leader, I think, of the women in the community, for sure. 
And despite all of this, and despite all the opposition we've talked about, you would have thought that her husband, Hubert, who himself was away at sea often, um, would be a, a source of comfort and support to her because he himself converts in 1890. But, but, but the sad truth is that actually he was a source of pain for her because he, shortly after their marriage, maybe six months after their marriage, it, it becomes a violent and abusive marriage. And on two occasions, uh, he tries to murder her. Uh, she only escapes the second time because of the help of her younger sister, Clara, who also had converted by that time. Um, and they, they peti she petitions for divorce, but she only is granted a 12-month um, judicial separation. Um, as far as we know, that they, they never lived together again after that. Um, but... Um, in, in the middle of that struggle with her husband before she 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 um, before she sues for divorce she is standing up for the rights of of for islam in the local press saying that islam grants um um sees a divorce not as a sac uh, sorry marriage not as a sacrament uh but, but as a contract and under islamic law it would mean that, you know, if that contract is breached, then a divorce could be granted. And so she was saying Islam is more progressive in the matter of women's rights than, 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 than English law was at the time. And she made that case in, 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 the, in the local press. Um, so, you know, I, we can see immediately how she is looking to her faith to offer her support against an abusive husband and is, look, and is you know, looking for... Uh, and is finding resources that she can draw on to help her in her life, you know. Um, and she does get out, and you know, she does, uh, you know, she she gets a break. She gets to go travel eat to the east for at least six months. We don't know exactly where she went, but we think our best guess is that she went to Beirut and possibly on to Damascus with a stopover in Alexandria. Um, and you know, she she gets some kind of respite. Um, and it, what's really charming about her travel east to the east is that she does it with two other English Muslims as well, Zaleika so Banks and Amina Makaish, which is charming in and of itself, the idea of the three Victorian working class uh, women of the north uh, going on a trip out east. So that's kind of you know the kind of thing the BBC should make a drop, <laughs> make a make a uh, you know make a they should tell Fatima a story. I think that is a challenge out there. I'm going to read a little bit from the marriage question. April 1891 disappeared in the Liverpool Mercury to the editors of the Liverpool Mercury. Gentlemen, your correspondent in one of her recent letters recommended one of your other correspondents to join the Muslim Church of Liverpool as their views with reference to the control of wives would be more in accordance with his and thereby insinuated that the state of the marriage laws amongst Mohammedans was even more unsatisfactory than in Christian England. This is one of the vulgar errors into which persons whose whole knowledge of Mohammedanism, Mohammedanism is derived from reading books and pamphlets written by bigoted, bigoted Christian missionaries, missionaries and others so often fall into. Therefore, permit me as a Muslim lady and wife to at once say that Mohammedan ladies enjoy and have done so ever since the time of the prophet much greater legal rights as to separate property divorce than those enjoyed by Christians up to quite a recent date. I mean, that's a very spiky, determined response from a tiny, tiny minority, isn't it? Well, I, that's what I'm trying to say, that why I think they're admirable is that they, they show lots of courage and a lot of gumption. You know what I mean? And they're not I think that's what um, I find almost that courage is what I find most inspiring to myself. You know, it, it it stiffens my back, I think, to read that, you know, because we have so many more, so many more advantages than than, than, than they had, you know, and, and rather than become, you know, converts become like professional whingers, but the community doesn't do this for me and doesn't give that for me. And there's these problems and how converts are received and so on. I just think we have to do it for ourselves and uh, just get on with it. Sorry, sorry to be sorry to be blunt, but you know, I I just think um, I think that there's a strain of kind of UO or something um, 
sometimes amongst converts in Britain, which I, I think is unhealthy. I think we we just have to we just have to get on with it. And um, you know, if there's a problem, let's try and solve it ourselves. You know, there there are over a hundred thousand converts to Islam in Britain. And, uh, you know, we're big enough now to kind of organize things and, and and solve things that aren't being solved, you know, and, and just get on with it. I think I'm not talking about a separate community. I'm just saying an organized community and working with everyone else so we can we can deal with some of these the issues and problems that the convert community faces today. That sounds like a whole other interview, which I would love to get into at some point. <laughs> Um, but maybe maybe not today. I'll tell you what, ha, let's end with um, how Fatima, uh, how her life ended and th then move on to, you know, really how the um, history, how that moment rather for the first convert community, how they vanished, how it, it didn't grow or did it? So, um, looking at the, um, looking at the, the evidence as we find it, it looks very likely that uh, Fatima was actually Abdullah Quilliam's secret third wife, um, and that the child of the, uh, the child that she had was his, um, Hubert Halim. Um, she spent the last years of her life uh, from eighteen ninety five onwards uh, living in West Kirby, uh, where she was renting out a boarding house, um, and. Um, so she was, why was she distant? I mean, we don't know. We don't have anything in her own voice from 1893. Um, maybe she wanted to get away from the complexities of life in Liverpool. Quilliam already had two other families. Um, the two wives couldn't stand each other by all accounts. Why, why would she want to be put in the middle of that? At the same time, Quilliam was also getting a lot of criticism um, from the wider Muslim community. Um, and, and maybe he didn't need the attention. Um, that a third wife would bring um so so, so uh, you know that th there are plenty of motives for her to move away but we don't know the exact reason um and she dies young you know at the age of 35 um, uh, um had been ill for a couple of years uh um quilliam um uh, quilliam for adopts uh hubert halim and 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 you know brings him up so you know fatima um like the rest of the community, it was largely forgotten. Um, uh, the doors closed on the mosque in 1908. And um, the, the community is no longer organised. So, you know, there's no organised activities going on in Liverpool. That doesn't mean necessarily that that was the end of everybody's faith. Although I do think there's evidence that not many of the children remained within the faith, as far as we can tell. Um, but many of the many of the women in particular and some of the men had moved away some uh, married uh, born muslim men and settled abroad in india and turkey for instance um so it's not well not necessarily the end of the story but that's a lot of work to find out trace all those families histories so we don't know the details um uh Knowledge of this community was kept amongst small the small convert circles in Britain. I'm talking about outside of the Quilliam family itself. So there was a knowledge passed on up to our times. Um, the main link person I knew was the late Dawood Rosa Owen, who established um, the Association of British Muslims in the in the mid 70s. He knew people who had who had known Quilliam. So that there was like a direct link, but very little was practically known about the community until the historical research that we've done in recent years has undertaken. So there was a bit of knowledge. And also Liverpool Muslims rediscovers William by finding copies of his journal in, in the local library in, in, in the early 70s. So that's why you get the foundation of the Abdullah Quilliam Society in the late 90s, comes out of that local historical research that's being done by Liverpool Muslims. So people are beginning to rediscover, but I think really it becomes a big thing, I think, in the last 20 years, really, and um, by the work of many, many people, including Ron Jeeves' um, biography, and then you get the BBC covering, and the, you know, the mosque reopens in 2014, you know, and you get more and more like media attention. Uh, and what we want to do with Fatima, Fatima's grave was rediscovered in 2019. Uh, we had a headstone put 
there through a community fundraiser last Ramadan. And the, the headstone was put up in November. And then we had this marvelous commemoration in January. We had 13 convert associations come from across the country to commemorate Fatima's life. And it was a marvelous day, honestly. I mean, there was a real Were sense there of, tears? I would have been crying because that's... It was very, the, very moving. And yeah. Jumana Moon did a, 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 an account of Fatima's life that was incredibly moving. Um, and you know, it, it was a, everybody felt we you know we did prayers at her grave, you know, finished the khatam of the Quran, and we had people coming from all different backgrounds, you know, Sufi, Salafis, like all kinds of different backgrounds, everyone coming together and um, commemorating this remarkable uh, our founding mother, really, our mother. Do you know, I feel uh, so moved about this because a convert converts often leave nobody to pray for them after they've passed. So to our dear brothers and sisters watching this, please, when you make your du'as, add the converts and their children to your du'as, just generically. And oh Allah, all those who are struggling in your past, all those who are new, and all those in the past who, who sought to, to keep the, you know, the faith alive in far-flung places, please don't, don't forget them, don't forget us. Yeah, and that's right. Yeah, Rabbana la taziq qulubana ba'da athadaytana wa habla min ladunku rahma innak anta wahhab. Amen. You know, I, I mean, uh, and, and and please, you know, anybody listening, please remember Fatima uh, in, in your prayers as well. And, and may Allah raise her rank, you know, for her sacrifices that she made. Because she is our mother, you know, for anyone who is uh, a Muslim a con Muslim convert in Britain, she she's the pioneer. Uh, she's the one who sacrificed and well, she's the one who laid the foundations. Thank you so much, Brother Yahya, um, for spending time today uh, talking us through that. This is the, the, the book, Our Fatima of Liverpool. It's available online and uh, all the places where you normally get your books. And um, it's, it's a great read. And uh, as, as Brother Yahya said, please remember Fatima uh, and all the early Muslims in your du'as. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.